Hello, everyone. Many thanks for coming and also for the organizers of this amazing event. Yeah, I'm a cryptographer, and we are interested in bringing cryptographic schemes, of course, to the practice, so to the real life. So we are very excited in getting information from the community, right, to understand where are your needs and where we can actually develop uh, novel and practical solutions. So I'll have the pleasure to talk about a, a cryptographic primitive that we call verifiable timed linkable ring signatures. I will walk through you step by step what this is and where we see the applications, of course, are building payment channels in Monero with the advantage that we don't need to touch the transaction scheme. So this is joint work with my students, Erwin, who's currently at NTT Research, Julio, who's at the Max Planck Institute, and Fritz, who's uh, still working with me. The other two, unfortunately, graduated in the meanwhile. No, fortunately, right? But uh, whenever they're, they're, they're amazing, they need to leave. So let's start with the initial problem, right? So um, why, do we want to, why do we want to do payment channels? There are at least uh, three reasons for it. Of course, reducing transaction fees, increasing the speed, and of course, saving energy. Monero is doing much better in terms of transactions, as, all, as you all know, than, for example, Bitcoin, right? What we have is that we find blocks roughly every two minutes. Confirmation are roughly 10 blocks, which means um, the confirmation time is about 20 minutes. And of course, if you want to buy something in general, right, whatever is faster is, is better. Energy is in every, everyone's world, right? We should save energy wherever we can. Of course, the proof of work is, is pretty good in Monero, but the less transactions, the less blocks we need to put on the chain, of course, we save energy. And therefore, our whole motivation in general is to reduce the number of transactions that actually go to the chain. Of course, the alternative approaches like proof of stake, but as you all, of, as you all know, Proof of stake comes with their own problems and we often see a centralization of stake. So the question is, is it a decentralized system? Many people are working on proof of useful work. So how can we use these individual proof of works in a better way? Um, again, these are open, open research problems. So we're interested in this work for at least uh, these three reasons, reducing transaction fees, um, faster transactions in general, and saving energy. So what I will do next is I will give an introduction in what are payment channels, channels in general, how do we use them, what are ring signatures, and of course linkable ring signatures. I will not focus on the confidential transactions as they're used in Monero, just to keep the scheme um, simple enough, right? You can upgrade it, but for the main idea is this, this will be sufficient. We will talk about verifiable time signatures, and this brings us to the question how can we embed the time lock that we have, for example, in the Bitcoin scripting language cryptographically? How can we re realize that? And the green parts are essentially the novel stuff, the verifiable time, linkable ring signatures, efficient constructions. How can we do this? And finally, how do we integrate this into Monero without changing uh, the transaction scheme? So let's get started. Of course, what are off-chain payments? So the basic idea is the following. The main idea is to reduce the number of transactions that actually need to go to the chain. And the payment channel, I'll do this high level and we will dig a little bit deeper step by step. A payment channel is one transaction that opens the channel. Then there are many transactions going on between the participants that are all off chain. And there's one transaction that closes the channel. So the challenging problem here is the following. And I'll start with a little example in Bitcoin. The challenging part here in general is that you have somehow to lock a certain amount of coins. So there's a transaction that says, I will lock an amount of coins, and this is the amount that we can transmit in the meantime. And for security reasons, this, there must be a possibility to send this money back, right? So for example, if Alice says, I'm opening the channel with a capacity of 10, and Bob, for example, says, I'm not interacting with you, then without this time lock, this money would be, would be locked forever. And the time lock essentially says, after a certain period of time, if nothing happened, then the money goes back to, to Alice. We will see this shortly more in detail. And to close this channel, we will essentially create some sort of multi-sig that says that's the final state of the channel um, where we both agreed on. Okay, so the initial transaction here 
to open a channel with a certain capacity and the final transaction on the chain that says, okay, we use the following capacity in that way. Okay, so let's start, let's start with ingredients. I mean, signatures is clear for everyone, right? Ring signatures as well, but let's recall them briefly. So uh, the cool thing of a ring signature is that you can essentially sign a document, but the linkability to the signer is unclear. In other words, whenever you build your ring with a certain set of members, then the only thing that the person that verifies the signature knows it was one out of these people, but you cannot tell who it was. That's the property that is, with, that is known as anonymity. Building a cryptocurrency purely from this assumption is not enough, right? And why? It's clear that essentially Alice, if, if there would be no additional property, she could build two different rings and perform a double spending attack. And this would be un, would, cannot be detected in the setting, right? Because you just know it was one out of these, the, these guys. And this brings us to um, the, link, uh, the, the linkable ring signatures, which are essentially used in a variant in Monero as well. And the idea is super nice and elegant, right? So you still have the non anonymity property, right? So you still don't know who signed it, but in case that, you, that you're signing a second transaction twice, in other, in other words, if you try to perform a double spending attack, then this double spending can be detected. Very beautiful. Okay, so now we are taking the next component that we need, and this is called a verifiable time signature. Initially, these primitives were found um, over 20 years ago, and cryptographers didn't look at them for quite some time. And then we realized that we can do stuff with them that we cannot do with them out, uh, otherwise, right? So, for example, there's a huge area of fairness which says, for example, can we compute a signature in a fair manner? It's impossible in general, but with these primitives, it works. So, what is it? Well, intuitively, it, it behaves like a regular signature, which means, right, so Bob can create a signature, but it has this additional cool property that you can commit to the signature in a verifiable way. So think about it, you can put your signature in a box but, and, and give a proof, right? So the, the proof will tell you there is a valid signature in this box. And the interesting property is the second one. There is a defined cryptographic mechanism to open that box within a certain number of computations. It means that there is an opening called force opening and after T steps of computation, you can get the signature. Okay, so these are the properties. Time, privacy. Before everything, before this time T, everything stays hidden, right? So you can't, can't just uh, see it. And verifiability, you can be sure whatever is in the box is in fact a valid signature, right? So the verification goes within the box. And the very cool property is that is taken from the time lock puzzles that essentially says after the time T, you definitely get back a valid signature. So the basic idea here is that there is a sequential squaring operation in RSA groups for which we just know the only way to compute this are exactly T steps. So you can choose your bound T with respect to the computation that are needed in, in these groups. And the whole idea will be to replace the time lock that Bitcoin uses as a script in a cryptographic way through, um, through the time lock signatures. Okay, so let's put everything together. As I said, fair computation um, is, is impossible in general, well, in certain models, but uh, of course, in the setting of blockchain with these, with these uh, primitives, we can do it. So what did, we do, what did we do? So we essentially embedded both parts together which means we introduced the, the notion of verifiable timed linkable ring signatures. So we are embedding this property cryptographically into the scheme. We found the very efficient construction and this allows us to integrate it inside of Monero without changing the transaction scheme. And of course, I mean, the argument uh, is the same, right? Scalable, cheap payments that save energy. So let's take a look how this actually works. So from a very high level, and I, I give you the, the reference to the paper, 
the interface looks very similar to the classical uh, time signature scheme, with the main difference that here we have a linkable ring signature scheme. So you still can commit to the signature, right? Now it's a linkable ring signature. You can verify that you have such an object inside of this box, and you can definitely open it after performing T steps of computation. So let's start with a naive approach and see if, we, if this is enough, if we can directly can uh, obtain payment channels. Well, this is our payment channel, and as I said, we are digging a little bit deeper into how they are constructed. So to open the payment channel, both parties are actually creating a joint address, which means this, from this address, we can only spend if Alice and Bob sign it. And it has the capacity of 30 coins, and it, the channel should last for time t. Right, so here this expiration time, of course, in the first step would be realized with uh, time locks that we, for example, have in, uh, in Bitcoin. And now these parties can interact between each other and they can update the channel, which means um, they're creating transactions that essentially say pay one coin from this joint address to Bob. And they do so, for example, for let's say, um, let's say 30, 30 transactions, right? So these transactions here are between both parties and this transaction here is the one that is sent, sent to the chain. Each transaction would be signed by the linkable ring signature in Monero. Again, we are omitting the confidential part to make it easier. And to close the channel, Bob will essentially post, ideally, the last transaction on the chain. And uh, this would correspond to the final state of the challenge. So in other words, what we get is, is if we perform 30 payments, we just need two transactions that go to, that, that go to the chain. Unfortunately, right, there are no time lock, there's no time lock script in Monero, and therefore this direct and naive realization doesn't work. And this is where our, um, our VTLRS kicks in, and they would essentially would look as follows, right? I mean, somehow we need to, we need to embed this functionality without, uh, without sending it directly to the chain, and it work, would work as follows. These both party, they create a refund transaction, and this refund transaction says, pay 30 coins from this joint address to Alice, right? So Alice initializes the channel and she wants to make sure if everything, if something goes wrong, I get my money back. And therefore this initial payment here, this capacity will be sent from the joint address back to Alice. And now Bob will essentially pack this joint address here in a time lock puzzle. Right, so this time lock puzzle will then make sure if we choose T uh, correctly, that Alice can recover this transaction if anything goes wrong and post it to the chain in order to get her money back. And on the other hand, Bob, right, I mean, they're performing this payment channel that we saw before. He needs to make sure that he's pushing the correct state of the channel before time T, otherwise the address is gone. Okay, so Alice starts solving the puzzle, the, the puzzle and if the final transaction wasn't posted to the chain, she gets her money back. So how can we actually do this uh, directly in Monero? And as I said, we are not looking at the, um, at the confidential transaction just for simplicity, but it works exactly the same way. So as you know, right, this is the basic structure where the secret keys is an element X and the public keys G to the X. And we are essentially choosing the ring as always, let's say with N participants. This is then the, um, the easier realization where, of course, the first part is the linkability tag that we need to detect the double payment. And here inside, right, that's the loop that goes over uh, all the participants. And we are essentially creating some aggregated form of a Schnorr signature um, that we can then verify in the end. So somehow we need to find a method to, to embed our idea of the time lock puzzles inside of this structure. And the ideas that we essentially used are based on prior work that we published uh, at CCS 2020, where we were wondering how can we improve the efficiency of uh, time signatures, and we found many constructions, so based on Schnorr, ECDSA, and, uh, and BLS. And the basic idea is essentially the following. 
we take a signature that has these beautiful algebraic properties that we need, and what we then do is we secret share this value with a, with a T out of N Shamir secret sharing scheme. So for those that, uh, I guess most of you know what this is, right? So you split your secret in several parts. Each part doesn't reveal anything about, uh, about the secret, which would be the signature. And you only need a threshold, this is the value T. As long as you get T values back, you can reconstruct the original, original value. And then our idea was to secret share each, um, basically to time log each of these secret shares and to provide a proof of correctness that essentially says, I'm giving you, I'm proving in, uh, of course, non-interactively, that T minus, T minus one of these puzzles, of these puzzles were, correct, were constructed correctly. So you will need this proof in order to make sure that, you will be, that, that the guy who created this share is not, uh, is not cheating. So what you will obtain is essentially commitment and proof pi and the proof pi corresponds to the, uh, the opened, open puzzles, right? So this is the idea. And um, we will take a closer look at the structure, right? This is the proof, the unopened puzzles, and the open signature shares. And now the nice idea is essentially, I mean, how would you do this, the verification and false opening? You first check that all signatures are valid, and this you can do very efficiently because it's a Schnorr signature or a Schnorr type signature. In the next step, you would start solving the puzzles in order to, to, to get one more share, right? That's sufficient because you got T minus one um, values before. And then with this T shares, you can actually reconstruct the signature. And here we are relying on other work uh, that by, by, by Aravind and Julio that ap appeared at uh, Crypto19. The nice thing is that these puzzles are uh, homomorphically, so you can just uh, compress them, and it works quite efficiently. So how do we embed this? Well, the idea is that if we take a closer look on the structure of the signature, then instead of giving out this value as zero directly, what we will give out is a commitment. And this commitment will have exactly the structure here. And with this structure here, we can essentially nicely embed this into uh, into our puzzle, and this follows essentially previous ideas that we that I just uh, mentioned before. Regarding the performance for a theoretician like me, right, it sounds awesome. So we implemented this, of course, uh, in a local test net, and the commitment time to compute the commitment is around 568 milliseconds. Verification time is about 476 milliseconds, and I'm seeing I'm running out of time. But in summary, if you essentially look at the um, computation times, also considering different various variants of latency, then we essentially got almost 94,000 uh, signatures per CPU core in uh, transactions per CPU core in two minutes. Okay, so that's all. I'm over my time. I thank you for your attention. I hope that, uh, that I could catch everyone, and I'm looking forward to questions. Thank you. Mm -hmm.